A man and his companion inhaled an unknown powder and, within a second, they both turned into horrific zombies. The world was hit by a zombie crisis, but fortunately, the government developed a medication that could restore zombies back to humanity, referring to them as PDS. However, survivors remained wary of PDS, struggling to accept these transformed beings. Then, a PDS claiming to be the undead prophet changed everything. He gathered those unaccepted by society and formed an extremist group known as ULA. They independently developed a drug called Blue Oblivion, aiming to incite the second resurrection mentioned in the Bible. This drug could revert PDS back to their bloodthirsty zombie instincts, marking the beginning of their retaliation against humans. Meanwhile, in the clinic of Rortun Village, Kieran was undergoing a routine checkup. Since Rick's definitive departure from this world, he had finally moved past his mental block and planned to go on a study trip to rediscover his passion for painting. But just as Kieran left the clinic, he was startled by a zombie that came at him out of nowhere. It turned out to be Gary, who had caught a zombie in the wild and brought it to the clinic to collect a bounty. Kieran noticed the zombie had been shot in the knee and, without giving it much thought, reported this to the nurse at the window. This action directly halved Gary's bounty, leading Gary to glare at Kieran with fury. Soon after, the new village official, Maxine, and Adi arrived at the pub together. As a member of the new Vita party, Maxine's visit to Rortun Village was to survey public opinion. She took this opportunity to preach the Vita Party's slogan to the locals, protect the living, penalize the dead, a motto that won the approval of two ladies, prompting Maxine to offer them a drink. At that moment, Kieran was working at the bar. Maxine accidentally touched Kieran's hand, the cold touch startling her. It was then Maxine realized Kieran was a PDS. Her facial expression turning noticeably odd. Maxine looked around and noticed another table where a villager was having a lively chat with another PDS. This made her suspect that Rortun Village might not be as she had imagined. Maxine's odd reaction piqued Kieran's curiosity. When he got home, he searched the computer and stumbled upon the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be fooled by the lies peddled by the corrupt elite. These so-called partially deceased syndrome sufferers. Option is a cold, hard killer that cannot be reasoned with. The PDS sufferer in your home, in your shop, in your pub, is one missed dose away from tearing your head apart. Later, Kieran visited Rick's grave. While he was pouring out his grievances, a voice came from behind him. It was Amy who had returned from her travels. They embraced each other excitedly. Amy introduced him to a fellow PDS, a man named Simon, who claimed to be one of the twelve disciples of the undead prophet. Simon invited Kieran to join their liberation movement, but Kieran did not agree with their methods, stating it was merely a group of PDS attacking humans without cause. Simon explained that violence was not unilateral. Not long ago, a man shot ten PDS in the head. But the judge only sentenced him to five years because PDS patients were considered only half-human. ULA was formed to protect the resurrected from harm by the living. When injustice becomes law, resistance becomes a duty. These words planted a seed in Kieran's heart. Elsewhere, Maxine settled into a village inn. Sandra expressed her support for the Vita party, wishing all PDS would disappear. Sandra's urgency in her words surprised Maxine, who only understood the reason when she entered the living room. It turned out Sandra's mother-in-law, Connie, was a PDS. Sandra thought she'd enjoy life after Connie died, but to her surprise, Connie turned into a zombie, and even more unexpected, she became a PDS. Now Sandra had to endure Connie's nagging till death. Frustrated, Sandra went out to feed the cat, but as she searched for the kitty, a wild zombie lunged at her. The people inside heard the noise but were too scared to approach. Ultimately, it was Maxine who took initiative, using a drill to take care of the zombie. The next day, Maxine brought up last night's zombie incident at the meeting, stating the need to re-establish patrol teams and erect fences around the village to ensure the residents' safety. Maxine's proposal was met with unanimous approval. However, Adi felt his authority was threatened, so he arranged to meet Maxine in the evening to discuss something important. That evening, Maxine arrived as promised, and Adi led her into the yard. Pointing to the small cabin in front of them, he told her that inside lay his deceased wife. He explained that eliminating all first wave resurrected would herald the second wave of resurrection, which would bring back our dearly missed loved ones. Adi revealed he knew the real reason Maxine was here. If they could cooperate, 
Both could get what they needed, but Maxine firmly stated she did not wish for a second resurrection, as Rortun village was already in chaos. Adi, feeling his achievements unrecognized and insulted by Maxine, became furiously enraged. Seeing this, Maxine hurried inside. Just as she was about to call for emergency help, she noticed the village records on the table, listing the first wave of resurrected individuals. Maxine glanced back at the pain Adi, his words awakening a realization in her. So, she put down the phone, took the records, and left. Meanwhile, Amy and Simon arrived at the pub, but their untimely attire provoked anger among the patrons. Cover up or get the hell out, you fucking rotters! Kieran, seeing this, had no choice but to ask Gary and his companions to leave the pub, which irritated Gary. Gary stepped forward to mock Kieran, who retaliated by pushing Gary to the ground. As the two were about to brawl, Simon stepped in and locked Gary in a hold. The pub owner, Pearl, seeing this, quickly pulled out a handgun to stop them. Kieran attempted to explain himself to Pearl, but she pointed the barrel of her gun at him. Kieran remembered Pearl telling him earlier the day that the future of the pub was in his hands, only to turn against him now. Annoyed, Kieran slammed the pub keys on the table and left. Elsewhere, Maxine returned to the inn, where she arranged the names from the records on the wall. Evidently, Adi's words had led her to conceive some sort of plot. Jem was terrified by the zombie in front of her, yet just a second ago, she was seen as a zombie slayer by everyone. During the outbreak of the zombie crisis, Jem voluntarily joined the Rortun village human militia. With her revolver, she made zombies tremble in fear. But as zombies began regaining their humanity and society restored order, the human militia became redundant, and Jem returned to school as a high school student. However, Jem found herself without friends at school, looking at her classmates chatting lively in the distance while she was alone, feeling desolate. Jem's gaze led the boy Henry to misunderstand. Henry had harbored a crush on Jem from a long time ago, but unfortunately, he turned into a zombie. Although he's now a PDS, he missed his chance. He took out a bracelet he made with Jem's name on it, showing his friends he was determined to pursue Jem. In class, the teacher discussed the history of the dead's resurrection. Two scholars invented a medication that restored the humanity of zombies, stopping their spread and restoring order to humanity. Then, Henry mentioned the human militia and pointed out that Jem was once a member, sparking the teacher's interest. Thus, Jem had no choice but to go up and share her experiences. Jem's story made her classmates see her in a new light, and even the teacher praised her as a combat hero. As a result, Jem gained Charlotte's approval, who then invited her to dine together. At that moment, Henry approached to invite Jem to be study partners, but Charlotte interrupted him before he could finish his sentence. Clearly, Charlotte and her group harbored a strong disdain for PDS. Elsewhere, Kieran headed to the station, planning to go to Paris. Amy had been waiting there for a long time, hoping to persuade Kieran to stay, but after the conflict in the pub the night before, Kieran was determined to leave. Unexpectedly, the ticket seller informed Kieran that he couldn't sell a ticket to him and asked him to wait there for further instructions. Soon after, Philip arrived, asking them to follow him to the village hall. All the village's PDS had already gathered there, and then Philip played an announcement. As PDS sufferers give back, we'll give back to them too. On completion of the enterprise, PDS sufferers will have a chance to apply for re-citizenship to the United Kingdom. Working together, we can build a safer, civilized future. Maxine also appeared with volunteer vests, and everyone reluctantly accepted the reality. Kieran, not giving up, asked Maxine if he could be exempt from the program. However, Maxine stated that his citizenship had been revoked and his passport was no longer valid. Only after working for six months would he have a chance to regain it. Kieran could only return home dejectedly. His family comforted him, reminding Kieran that he now had plenty of time and that six months would pass quickly. Coincidentally, Charlotte came to see Jem. They discussed in her room about the items related to zombie incidents that the teacher had requested for the next day's class. Charlotte suggested Jem bring her combat medal, a token of honor for her zombie hunting. At that moment, Kieran walked in, intending to give the foundation liquid to his sister. However, knowing Charlotte's aversion to PDS, Jem intentionally drove Kieran out of her room. The next day, in the school bathroom, Henry and his friend planned to teach those who despised PDS a lesson. He made another boy inhale blue oblivion. At that moment in the classroom, Charlotte was holding her family's photos, about to share her own story, when she was interrupted by screaming from outside. 
The teacher hurried out to check and found the boy who had reverted to his zombie instincts. Everyone rushed into the classroom, and the teacher ordered everyone not to go outside. A girl discovered zombies were blocking the neighboring classroom. Charlotte then declared that Jem had taken down hundreds of wild zombies before. And now with only one zombie, it should be easy for her. She handed a machete brought by someone else to Jem, who had no choice but to step out. The zombie was quickly attracted to Jem, seeing the terrifying zombie in front of her. Jem panicked. She had always used a gun to deal with zombies and had never used a machete before. As the zombie approached, Jem, unable to hold back her fear, felt a warm flow and immediately dropped the machete, frantically pounding on the door. Fortunately, the zombie stopped moving due to the drug wearing off, allowing Jem to escape unharmed. Inside the classroom, Charlotte mockingly said, So, this is your combat hero. Soon after, Charlotte confronted Jem, who was changing her pants. This was my dad. His name was Richard. And on February the 5th, you murdered him in Rotten Supermarket. They gave you a medal and called you a hero? But you're not! You're a coward and everyone saw that today! Making Jem feel incredibly guilty, the trio responsible for the incident was found by Maxine who confessed they had bought the drug from the Undead Prophet's website. The teacher commented that if the human militia were still around, they would have been dead by now. This remark gave Maxine another idea. Subsequently, Maxine approached Gary, saying she could pay him a salary to monitor those PDS individuals. Even when the PDS returned to their homes, on the other side, Kieran was participating in a give-back program, installing protective nets around Rortun Village. That's when Simon came over. He comforted Kieran not to be so downcast and then showed the scars on his wrist. Simon shared that he died from injecting the entire periodic table. Preaching that seizing the day is the essence of living, he then invited everyone to a party he was hosting that night, reminding Kieran not to believe the government's six-month promise, as after six months, there would be an endless cycle of another six months. It's all just a scam. After returning home, Kieran did some online searching and stumbled upon a post that made him feel like a joke. Angry, he ripped off his vest and threw it on the ground. Then, Kieran pulled out the clothes he was resurrected in, deciding to attend Simon's party. Just like Simon said, to live is to enjoy life to the fullest. Deep in the forest, Simon's party was in full swing, with the village's PDS all gathered there. Henry spotted Kieran arriving and excitedly announced his plans to marry his sister, showing off the bracelet he made for Jem. Then Amy appeared, joking that Henry had overindulged on brains, not human brains, but sheep's brains. Meanwhile, Simon was asking others if they had any memories of their resurrection or knew who the first resurrected person was. That's when Kieran and Amy came over. Kieran wanted to have a private chat with Simon, so Amy suggested she'd go gather some more firewood. As they talked, Henry also left the party. Kieran offered to pay Simon to sort out his passport, but Simon said it wasn't a matter of money. He had learned about Kieran's experiences from Amy. Kieran wanted to change the villagers' perception of PDS on his own, but Rick's death made him want to flee. Simon suggested that perhaps he should stay, mentioning his family and Amy were here too. Then, he held Kieran's hand and smiled. Elsewhere, Jem was sitting alone on a bench, visibly distressed. Gary drove by, noticing Jem's poor mood, and took her out to the wilderness. He reminisced about their first mission together. Jem was only 14 then, facing zombies with calm and focus, and she saved Gary countless times that day. Gary praised Jem as the best fighter he'd ever partnered with. These words cleared the gloom in Jem's heart, prompting her to give Gary a spontaneous kiss. Then, Gary returned Jem's revolver to her, not wanting such an excellent warrior to be without a suitable weapon. With her gun in hand, Jem decided to patrol with Gary, and upon hearing a noise in the distance, she took the lead in chasing it down. Not far away, Amy, holding firewood, was preparing to return, constantly looking around due to the noises. Then, Jem saw a figure ahead and drew her revolver, aiming at the figure. As Jem pulled the trigger, the figure fell to the ground, hearing the gunshot. Gary rushed over, and seeing the figure on the ground, they were instantly at a loss. Haley lives in the same house with her current partner and her ex-husband. The ex-husband, named Freddy, returned from the dead to find his wife remarried to Amir, and his home had become their love nest, with nowhere else to go. Freddy had no choice but to temporarily stay with them. Although Amir always mocked him, Freddy never gave up, believing that Haley was just taken advantage of by Amir and that deep down, 
she still loved him. Therefore, Freddie bribed Dean, which is why Freddie did not participate in the PDS giveback program in the morning. Knowing today was Haley's birthday, he planned to surprise her. Freddie drove to find Haley and took her to the place of their first date. Reminiscing about their beautiful memories together, Freddie told Haley he wanted to leave Rortan Village with her and start over in a place they had always wanted to go, because their relationship had once been so wonderful. However, Haley urged Freddie to forget her, stating there was no longer any possibility between them. She blamed their situation on Freddie leaving too early and returning too late. On the other side, Kieran and Simon were assigned to volunteer work at the clinic. Dr. Russo asked them to clean the lobby inside and out because the wild zombies in the cages made the clinic smell terrible. Subsequently, they planned to temporarily let the zombies out. But Kieran's gentle approach annoyed Denise, who didn't want to dawdle with them all day. So, Denise personally demonstrated how to treat these zombies. But her rough actions angered Simon. In Simon's eyes, these zombies were his family. Simon wanted to save these two zombies. But Kieran suggested waiting for the Institute's people to come and use medication to restore their humanity. Simon argued that Kieran didn't understand the government's darkness, saying that if they were taken to the Institute, they would end up in an even worse situation. Later, while Denise was in the warehouse, Simon secretly took the keys to the cage. However, Kieran caught him and threatened to end their friendship, forcing Simon to reluctantly return the keys to Denise. Meanwhile, Jem went to Maxine to confess. Overwhelmed by guilt, she revealed that she had accidentally shot Henry the night before, but Maxine still felt it was best to visit the crime scene first. On the way, Jem said she just wanted to do the right thing and never intended to kill Henry. Yet, Maxine pointed out that Henry was the murderer, who might have killed many people since his resurrection. The government granted PDS a pardon, erasing all their past actions. Henry wouldn't be troubled by killing. Why should you be? Maxine argued. When they arrived at the scene, Jem discovered Henry's body had vanished. They searched around and quickly found a pile of burnt ashes. As they pondered, Gary appeared from behind them. Turns out he was worried about Henry's body being found, so he came over early in the morning to destroy it. Maxine said she authorized the night patrol, so she was responsible for it. She then went to Henry's mother, Sylvia, suggesting that Henry might have been recruited by ULA implying her son was still alive but she would never see him again. Later, Maxine and Gary met in the pub. She shared Gary, according to intelligence gathered by the Vita Party. Some extremist groups plan to find the first person resurrected in Rortan village to trigger a second resurrection. We must find him before anyone else to prevent the tragedy from happening again. She insisted. That evening, upon returning home, Haley found a note on the table left by Freddy. Freddy, still not giving up, wanted to elope with Haley. He hoped that seeing their token of commitment would change her mind. Subsequently, Haley went to the garage. Freddy had carefully decorated the place and presented the gifts he had prepared, thoughtfully making up for the ones he had missed. Haley couldn't help but feel joyful seeing these gifts, but she came to tell Freddy she wouldn't leave with him. She was no longer the person she used to be. Maybe I once loved Freddy deeply, but that was too long ago. Now, I just want to live well with Amir, she explained. Haley encouraged Freddy to also enjoy his new life, and they embraced one last time. Unexpectedly, Freddy suddenly started bleeding from his nose, having forgotten to inject his medication today, putting him at risk of turning into a zombie at any moment. Haley hastily called Gary. At that moment, Freddy handed Haley a hammer and exposed the back of his head to her. He wanted Haley to end him while he was still conscious, but Haley couldn't bring herself to do it. Freddy, raising his voice, urged Haley to act quickly. He didn't want to harm her, just as Haley was about to act. She was startled by Freddy's sudden change, dropping the hammer. Freddy, struggling to maintain his last bit of consciousness, kicked the hammer back towards Haley. However, the next second, Freddy fully turned into a zombie, luckily moving slowly due to just transforming. Outside the garage, Gary, who had rushed over, was using a rope to secure the rusty garage door. Then he drove his car to pull the door open, creating a small gap. Kieran, hearing the noise, rushed in, just in time to see Freddy approaching Haley. Gary followed, and seeing the dire situation, he shot Freddy in the knee, allowing Haley to escape. Kieran quickly calmed Freddy down and injected him with medication, but Freddy was eventually tied up and thrown into the car by Gary. Kieran learned Freddy would be sent to a detention center. I hear it's nice there. Oh, it was an accident, he didn't do anything. He can't do that. You'd be amazed at what I could do to your soul. What you can do, sod all about. Gary's words made Kieran feel helpless, 
realizing how ridiculous his idea of changing Rortun village was. Thus, a frustrated Kirin sought out Simon, deciding at that moment not to restrain himself anymore.